I would like to welcome uh, Michael Madsen, the director and also the scriptwriter of this, by my opinion, exceptional documentary, uh, Into Eternity, which was made on 2010. This is one of four documentaries uh, Michael made in the last 10 years. Uh, and beside that, he's also a conceptual artist, which I think is obvious also out of this Into Eternity movie, uh, concerning the excellent sound and uh, visual part of the movie. Uh, he's a member of uh, the group Van Gogh. This is the artistic group who is dealt more or less with the sound project. And in 1996, uh, he found the sound gallery in Kuvelhagen, which uh, is located underneath of the town hall uh, in Kuvelhagen. Doesn't exist. No. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also mentioned me before our talk that now he started to collaborate with one theater group, but which, about which we are going to to uh, to talk uh, later. I would like to start uh, with Into Eternity. Uh, in last uh, few years, um, on the field of uh, movie documentary, uh, there appeared some um, new approaches. Um, including uh, mockumentary, in which um, uh, fiction facts are um, presented uh, as uh, a reality. On the contrary, in your work, the so-called self-evident reality is shown as constructed and interpreted. Uh, and um, we could also see in the movie that uh, some interpretation, uh, some interpretations could really um, sound as complete fiction. As for example, uh, one guy um, is saying that if anybody could drill into Onkara, he would be definitely able to detect radioactivity, which is completely ridiculous because there is no proof for anything like that. Well, I, I can say that um for me, Into Eternity is not as such a film about nuclear waste. It's much more about the time span of 100,000 years, which I believe is for the very first time in human history that we are trying and in a way have to build something that has to last for this period of time in a foolproof manner without any human interference. Uh, it's also a facility that has as its very, at the basic construction principle is that it should be able to operate by itself. So that means that the engineers, they expect civilization as we know it, will cease to exist within this time frame. That's why it has to be able to operate by itself. So as a consequence, as a critic wrote about the film, this, this could be the first post-human structure that we have. And it's also not built in any religious context, that would be the, the, the case with the cathedrals or the pyramids. It's a, it's a purely scientific endeavor, mm -hmm. and as such I think it tells a lot about our time, and that was my interest in making the film. But the, the main argument for the facility is, of course, to act responsibly towards the future. So we should not impose undue burdens on the future, who, no matter what we do, will receive this present from us. And that's the basic narrative, you can say, that this company has. But if you look at how they communicate, coming back to this claim that if somebody in the future can drill a hole or dig a hole in the ground, which isn't really that difficult, uh, then they will know what it is. And I think that if you look at the narrative or the way that this company, the Finnish part of the company, communicates, that communication is all about the present. Mm -hmm. It's very carefully designed to tell the present day decision makers in particular, of course, that the future only holds two different scenarios. The one is constant technological development, mm -hmm. that is, more Nokia phones and new models for 100,000 years, or we'll go back to the Stone Age where we can dig a hole in the ground. And of course, this is a, 
a narrative that's designed to say that this will be safe in the future because the future looks like this. But the thing is that when you work with nuclear matter, so to say, you have some principles that guide that work. And one of these principles is called um, best practice. When you have a best practice principle, it means two things. First of all, that you have to do the best thing you can. That means, of course, in the case of this facility, Onkelo, meaning hiding place, that you have to consider the worst possible scenarios. And they, and they are, of course, that you can dig a hole in the ground, but you can't detect it. Secondly, such a principle tells you also that you don't really know what you're working with. That's why you work with a principle. And if you look at the history of, of radiation, which is only about 100 years old or a little more, you will see that it is a continuous story in which we at any point in time have thought that we knew everything about radioactivity. And all the times we've been discovering that there was something a little abata by, a little, a little something extra. This is why in France, for example, where I was recently talking to the French nuclear uh, waste uh, authorities, uh, that they, they have to decontaminate buildings in Paris where Madame Curie uh, was experimenting with these uh, glowing substances, uh, of course, without knowing really what radioactivity was. Um, you already said before in your answer now, but uh, it seemed that in all of your documentaries, nevertheless on the topic, uh, you are opening up uh, crucial issues, issues that they are crucial uh, for humanity and civilization. One is, as we already talked, um, the reality which is not uh, approachable by itself directly, but it is always structured. And the other thing is the ability and disability of communication, which is uh, also the issue not only in this movie, but uh, in the movie that you are occupied by now. And um, the second, uh, well, yes, the communication, and of course the identity. The identity in this movie, who are we? I mean, the civilization who is uh, extremely self-confident, but in fact, disabled to, to manage the energetic sources. How much did you know before uh, about Onkelo? Why exactly you choose Onkelo? Did you, uh, have you, did you search uh, a topic uh, through which you could develop and open up all those issues? Or those issues just came uh, into the surface uh, during the process? Well, this is, of course, when it gets a little bit embarrassing for me because I've, I, I was actually doing my dishes at home, which also has this tendency of piling up as nuclear waste has. And I was listening to the radio just to get my mind away from the tedious work of doing my dishes. And in a news program, I heard about that in Finland they're building this facility and it has to last for 100,000 years. And that time span got me interested because I realized that there has to be some engineers there who can relate to what 100,000 years is because I don't understand what that is. I still don't do that. But nevertheless, they have to understand it. And also, as I always say also, uh, nuclear waste, it does exist. And something needs to be done with it. It doesn't really matter if you're against nuclear energy or not. That It, it, it will not go away by magic. Um, so if they could get around this, if they can get around this, I believe they're actually solving a huge problem. But I had this kind of feeling when I first heard about it that since this is the first time, uh, since it deals with this time span that is equivalent to when the first humans of our kind, so to say, left Africa, um, and since it's, it's, it's built in a, in a kind of secular context, there are many things that hasn't been in, 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 in human history before. And I had the feeling that something would be hiding in this. And then I, what I did was that, that I went on research there um, and talked to all the various engineers and the types of hydrologists, geologists, because I said that I, I would really like 
to understand exactly what you're doing. I don't have any sort of hidden agenda. I actually think what you're doing is important. Um, and I, I'm very anxious to fully understand how you try to solve this. And at one point, I was talking with one of the long-term safety advisors, the 100,000 years, and I asked him, so, um, how, how are you going to try and inform the future about that this is dangerous? And then he said, well, actually, I think that we should just hide it. And that's when the hair sort of rose on my neck because I didn't understand that argument. I thought it was a scary argument. But of course then he, he, he explained to me that the thing is that even though, let's say, first of all, he, his opinion was that it's actually impossible to communicate in this time scale because we don't know what we're talking to. It's the same problem as really communicating with aliens as we have tried once on this the Voyager spacecraft. If you don't know how some, somebody thinks, it's, it, what is universal in terms of communication, communicating? And the thing is then that he said that even though, I mean, it, it might just awaken their curiosity. And then I understood that if the real threat to this facility is human curiosity, it's something within our nature, then this facility is nothing about a, a kind of technological achievement or marvel. And if it's resting inside ourselves, the real problem, so to say, how do we trick human nature? And I believe that curiosity is one of the hallmarks of human nature. I also believe that curiosity, in a way, is what led us to nuclear power since the Renaissance, natural scientific thinking, etc. Um, and, it's, and it's an interesting, you can say, paradox that nuclear energy is, I think, the epitome of human technological achievement, insight. It is really harvesting the energy of the universe. But at the same time, the waste it's the ultimate enlightenment, you can say, enlightenment. But, also, but then the waste has this kind of ultimate darkness because it has this time span involved. And who can look that far into the future? And consequently, who can see what might come up? Um, so it's, it's, an, it's an interesting paradox. And I believe that there are, no matter where you look around in this subject matter, there are paradoxes. Uh, how did you succeed to open those 10 speakers you choose? I mean, um, some of their answers are not really in accordance with the institution they are no. working no. Uh, with. They are obviously very surprised and as well embarrassed. Um, some of them more, some of them they are filling in those gaps of their fantasmas. And so, how did you succeed? Well, I, 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 I told them that I am genuinely interested in what you're doing and, and explained things like what I'm saying right now, that you are, I, I believe you're doing more than just digging a hole in the ground. I believe this is significant at some level and I'd like to try and understand that. And then in particular when it comes to the Finnish company that were the, the most difficult to, to deal with, um, then they knew, I mean, these American reports that, that the film is mentioning about the landscape of thorns, etc., that, that thinking, the Finnish experts knew that I've been reading those reports, thousands and thousands of pages. So they knew that they, they couldn't answer me, uh, they, they couldn't get around answering me. Uh, and then, of course, when you do interviews like this, you 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 keep on answering, un asking for for a question. And also, then, of course, I had this this um, you can say narrative device that, since this is a film that sort of is concerned with with deep time, um, and the bas the basic thing is that that this will be left to the future. Um, why not 
play with the idea of addressing the future. So by saying to the scientists, let's for a moment just forget about the present and let's imagine that the camera is an entity from the future and that you can address the future through this camera, then tell the future what you are at least hoping for. Because I know that you're in the process of making this and I believe that your concerns and your hopes and, and your doubts are equally as interesting as, as what you may have achieved. The structure I perceived extremely interesting because the narration, uh, the narration uh, is streaming through first uh, the discussion with those ten people. Uh, it's interesting that you didn't choose any philosopher or anthropologist. I mean, the only one who is a kind of exception is a theologian. Yeah. And then the, the second stream is going through your dialogue as a representative of our civilization with an uh, imagined human being or, let's say, uh, intelligent being, because we can also she think somebody understand. will come somewhere, from somewhere out space and so on, you know. And, uh, of course, you mentioned the camera, which is, uh, switches from time to time. It is a gaze of this imagined um, encounter. Could you, why, why, did you, why did you choose this uh, structure? Because I think exactly uh, in those three, uh, uh, in, uh, in between those three narrations, there is this gap uh, where the audience could go into the movie and identify very much, very emotionally, with the problem of the civilization, of uh, the, the problem of identity, what kind of civilization are we? I mean, if we are a kind of a danger for the future, because it's interesting, the, the very beginning you say, we borrowed something from you. Yeah, but I, I think that, that the whole problem in making this film was, of course, to get around that basically what all these experts are talking about is abstract and is fine to the future. And when you talk about, or you mentioned the, the, the number 100,000 years, it doesn't really mean anything because you can't it's relate to it. it. It is. So, so, so the, the, the challenge was somehow to make this be tangible at a different level. And the truth is that it was very, very difficult to get the film to work because for a long time it was just like an extremely boring radi radio, piece of radio, just with talking heads. <laughs> it was very difficult to get the visuals, which is basically just a hole in the ground, to get that to work on a more, you can say, mythological level. Um, but regarding the, the experts, then it was clear from the beginning that I only wanted people who were directly responsible and this is also why they all have this, they all sign mm -hmm. the film. Because behind the official person hired at a company sitting in the present, there is of course a human being. That's why signature. That's why the signatures and because they're responsible. So I didn't want anybody who would be, you can say, opinion makers who would just have an opinion about, well, this is good or this is bad. But why do they have, uh, why do they have a telegraph? Because, because he's a member of uh, a Swedish uh, nuclear council, which is an external council in Sweden who are put into this world exactly to ponder about what does this mean, but look at it from the outside. And he was assigned there because the, the woman who originated this, this think tank, uh, she said, we need somebody who can think about lots of time. And I can only think about it theologically. And, and, and the thing is that, that uh, I, I, from the beginning, I didn't actually want anything religious. And originally, the, the music was supposed to have been only Renaissance music. But there you have lyrics almost exclu exclusively religious. Because I, I want to get rid of the religious context, because there is no religious context in what they're doing. Uh, and also, I think that if we imagine that we were sitting in the future and this facility was rediscovered, um, of course, um, even though, as it is right now, nothing will be left behind to communicate to the future, of course the facility or the remains of the facility will be a sign in itself. That's unavoidable because there's a symmetry, etc. Mm -hmm. And if we imagine that the walls are excavated with all these numbers on them that's sort of tracking all the fault lines, 
then if we compare to the cave paintings that we have found in our time, the, the French ones, Lascaux for example, there is this difference that it is a purely rational uh, leftover, so to say, that we leave for the future. So if a future civilization finds this, I think that they will have a, a peculiar image of an, a, a purely rational civilization with no sort of transcendental thinking because after all when you look at the cave paintings that we have found although they were not in intended most likely to communicate anything to the future there are still some depictions of of hunting possible a, a dead person in France so there is this kind of afterworld thinking uh, or you can say a spiritual thinking at, at, at in some sense which is not the case here but 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 as such I do believe that it, it, it perfectly it represents uh, the time that, that I'm living in, which is a very rational time. What is your opinion? Could uh, the uncle, which means in Finnish, Wutlina, uh, the cave, mm -hmm. uh, could it really stay untouched for such a long period? And what is your opinion? Is it better to mark the danger or just to leave it in oblivion? I think that, uh, I think that if you don't mark it, you are you have the assumption that this will work for 100,000 years. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's, that's a huge confidence to, to put on something man-made, especially if you think about that when you go and buy a, a thing like this, for example, anything, you have two years warranty at most. So 100,000 years is, is, I think, su supreme confidence in what you're doing. And the thing is that if it doesn't work and you have no clues about what's down there, uh, then I think you're better off if there is some kind of manual left behind. What's the content? What's the construction principles? Um, uh, Etc. Uh, so, so, but, uh, but, but then again, you have the problem that how, how to really communicate that. So it's better to mark. In my personal opinion, I think we're obliged to try and mark it. I think I read somewhere that uh, you were thinking to leave. Yes, yes, it was, it, was, uh, it was in the script that I would uh, be leaving a, 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 yeah, a copy of, uh, of the oh. film uh, in, in halfway down in the tunnel. Uh -huh. Because we, you could assume that the tunnel would be the, the, where they would, somebody would go down. And if it's halfway down, you could still sort of hide it on the surface of the ground. It's not no radioactive already no, there? Not the now, there. not now. Uh, because the waste is not there yet. But if it's halfway down, then it has been detected. And then you, but, but then the problem is, of course, that you would need a, t a television and a DVD <laughs> player and, and all of that. Which, of course, the company were not, they were making very much fun of that. Maybe Nokia could also be involved in the problem. I agree, I agree. No, the best thing would be, as I normally joke with also, that, that if it should really work with the communication, we should have uh, stone slabs of every single frame in the film all the way down in the tunnel, and then perhaps it would be... But the idea was actually, uh, originally, that there would be a graphical layer in the film uh, with a Rosetta Stone approach, so there would be three different sort of layers of communication so that ideally you would be able to see this film, even though you, do, you would do, wouldn't understand English, uh, you would be able to decipher what this was about. And a discussion in, in the, between me and the production company was, of course, who is the audience to this film? Because are we really making a film for people 100,000 years from now or for the present? <laughs> Maybe not really for the people, because uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the issue of communication, uh, the ability of communica communica communication is also the issue of your film that you are preparing now. And uh, the film is titled The Visit, the film on the ultimate Copernican revolution. And the film is about humanity, humanity's encounter with extraterrestrials. Uh, interesting thing is that uh, the film is uh, making in cooperation with United Nations, uh, concretely with the office in Vienna, who is, uh, as I understand, in charge for uh, diplomatic, uh, let's say, for uh, diplomatic affairs with extraterrestrials. It, it was the office of outspace. No, there, there is an office in 
in Vienna, it's called the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. <laughs> and today they are dealing with keeping tracks of satellites. So, but they have also they have been they are the ones who have been sort of drafting the space law, which is the law that governs activities on the moon and other celestial bodies. In the space law, there are a few references to possible extraterrestrial encounters, such as it talks about that astronauts are to be regarded as the as envoys of mankind. And also if anybody is to encounter something or phenomena uh, that could somehow affect life on Earth, it should immediately re be reported back to the human. So if we imagine that this Earth would be visited by an alien intelligent life form, um, this office is where the phone would eventually ring because the United Nations is the only sort of uh, supranational uh, entity in the world. And it has been discussed in the United Nations uh, back in the 70s that yes, it is likely that there are extra, extraterrestrial civilizations and as we know from Earth, the first encounter is very important. So we should have some protocols on how to do that. There are some protocols that the SETI Institute has done because the idea is that the first encounter would most likely be by radio signals in a way because they travel so fast. But the visit is in a way doesn't care about the practicalities. It's more interested in what would we actually do in case we had a direct encounter. And this office have agreed very hesitantly and, and we, we need to massage them again, we can, we can feel from them, but to, uh, to perform a full-scale drill where they have the first emergency meeting at the office, collecting the sort of the relevant persons and saying that how should we deal with this? I mean, who should talk to them? Who should feed them? Who should build a golden cage so we can contain them that they won't, won't notice it? Uh, the carpet. All, all of everything imaginable. And of course, my interest is what is it that we can't imagine? Because I think the only thing for certain to say about this encounter is, of course, that it would be beyond what we can, because some of the ideas that exist about alien life is interesting, it's also a little bit funny, so I hope to make it a little bit funny also. But for example, it's, it's imaginable that an alien life form could have lifespans of several hundreds and thousands of years, for example meaning that, for example, travel isn't that big a problem. Or it could perhaps be pure forms of energy. Uh, and the idea with this film is simply that to take the best experts in the world and have them imagine what they would do and to let one expert's imagination feed into the next and so create an although it's an imaginary scenario, it is still a complete scenario. Um, and uh, so far, I, I we just began collecting these experts and they are extremely en enthusiastic, of course, because it would be the ultimate encounter Delusion. for them and, and for, for all of us. And, 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 and of course, it's a film about ourselves again because the space law reflects a lot about the Cold War. It's, it's clear that it's written in that context. Uh, and of course, these imaginations, they, um, they all feed back to ourselves because how can we imagine something beyond our, uh, what we have uh, experience with? In both cases, there is a, a question of uh, communication, our communication with the radical other. Yeah. Radical other that we can't really imagine how it will look like, how it will react and so on. Yeah. Not so long ago, you, uh, you said that uh, about this movie that you are preparing now, that uh, it will be or a sheet or a gold. Mm -hmm. So in which... Uh, uh, well, election is I, I hope right for now. the gold, of course, but yeah. uh, that's... How it's going right now? I well, know. I don't know, because the thing is that, that in a way, and that's a little bit annoying, I think, but in a way, this new project does a similar thing visually as Into Eternity, because in, in the visit, we will never see this alien entity. It's, it's about, it's, the idea is to dream it up inside everybody's spectators' heads. But the way the camera performs is 
as something else is watching us. And because the only thing to say for certain is that it would be something complete out of, out of, out of unimaginable, it has to be shot in a new way. And I think that I have gotten the idea of filming in a new way, which I don't know if it'll work because uh, maybe people will get an epileptic attack or they will think it's, it's magnificent. But actually this Monday and for 10 days we are testing the visual concept and also the editing, which is very closely knit, knit together in this one. But I don't know if it, I, I, it's, it's five different principles. Some of them will work, I think. Uh, but the, the core one, I, 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 I just don't know yet. Uh, but, but working with things like this, of course it is actually, as you will all know, I'm sure, it's much more interesting to try and do something that hasn't been done before and also it's perhaps better to fail in a grand way than, than to make something uh, mediocre in the end. Inti Taranti got many awards, I think more than 20 mm -hmm. on the festivals around the world. And uh, not only that, uh, it also uh, surpasses the artistic world. You already mentioned that you're lecturing in for Arden, the uh, uh, agency for nuclear um, energy okay. in France. And I found uh, on the net that uh, the DVD was on the desk of Hillary Clinton and that you had some lectures for the United Nations also in the summit on nuclear, uh, nuclear energy, yes. Um, but what was the response of those 10 speakers after they watched the movie? What were the responses of, it? were there any responses of those workers we see in the movie who will get so-called scientific disease? And uh, were there some responses of any archaeologists? Because I could denote this movie as uh, uh, archaeology of the future. Well, the, 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 the Finnish company has said that the film has its moments. That's, that's all they've said about the film. Yeah. And it was a troublesome collaboration with them. But the Finnish nuclear safety authorities, as well as the Swedish and also the Swedish company who are collaborating with Pussyga, the, the Finnish company, they have all been using the film internally and screening it for their employees. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think they believe it's, it's a very uh, good film. It's a very sort of adequate uh, depiction of the questions that are involved in this. And uh, I, I also know that, that some of the workers, the tunnel workers, that they, uh, that they like the film a lot, of course, even though that, that when we filmed the film, they of course had, had not really, although I of course tried to explain why are we doing it like this, and they didn't really understand that. Um, so I, I think that the, 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 the Finnish company has, they obviously perceived the film as a threat to, to their work, which was a surprise because uh, it was not, um, it was never intended to be a kind of Michael Moore film where I will go and reveal something and this is nasty people. Um, so when it sort of got very tense, uh, it was very, very strange to be dealing with. Um, could you explain, uh, you're mentioning the Finnish company, the Swedish company, because Uncle, in fact, this uh, repository is near the uh, nuclear plant, which is um, located on the southwest of Finland. Yeah. So, um, but um, they're also involved um, the specialists from the Sweden. Yeah, Sweden and Finland are collaborating simply because yeah. it's the same bedrock and there are only a few hundred kilometers. Ah, because it's on the border, of course. On yeah. the border, yeah. yeah. But the thing is that when I first got to the Finnish company, I thought that they would have all the expertise mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, I thought they would have a think tank with the semiologist, mm -hmm. with the philosopher, uh, with perhaps some, some artist uh, or, or some science fiction writer or whatever. But if you only do... But they, they, were, they were only geologists and, and so, so they said, Michael, for those uh, soft questions, please go somewhere else because we are building it and that's really, that's, we are making, we are doing actions. Go, go south uh, if you want uh, those questions. And this is why I went to, to the Swedish company 
and they were much more open and much more interested. The reason why the, 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 the two Swedish scientists are the woman and the man sitting together, and the reason why they are these two is that when I came, I was supposed to be talking with, with the man only, he's the head of construction of the, the, the Swedish uh, facility. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, Martin, this is really so interesting. We have to, to bring uh, her in also. And, and then, fine, then we'll do that. Um, so a very different approach to, also to the public from the Swedish side. Uh, future is also an issue in your conceptual work um, uh, with uh, the group of Van Gogh, uh, I found um, the project title uh, the, uh, the Sound Library for the Future. Yeah. Could you say a bit more uh, what's about this project? It's already done, as yeah, I understand. The, the, that was a conceptual work where we, would, we were asked to think about how a, a music library could be for the future. Uh, so that was very much questions about um, now that you can download everything on the internet, why go to the library to borrow some music? Mm -hmm. So that was a, in a, an attempt at creating a library that would really an art piece, meaning that you would go there and you would get away with some, something else than you actually came there for, uh, which is I, I suppose the goal of any library that you expand the horizon of people who get there. But some of the things that we were inspired by was that in Norway there is the only, I believe, uh, archive for sound mm -hmm. in the world. They also have this the, the seed wall at Svalbard, which is seeds that are in this perma bunker, permafrost bunker. Uh, but they also have this archive for sound, and they have made this report uh, all, partly by philosophers to well, philosophize about what is a oral statement that is in a person who has been talking a hundred years ago, archive, what does that mean when you listen to this person's sound, etc. Those were some of the things that we were interested in, but the idea was to create a whole experience in terms of that when you were visiting this place, then on every level there would be something uh, you can say tickling your uh, oral uh, sensitivity and of course also your mind. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, there would be um, uh, automatic suggestions on what that you should borrow of sound and some of the suggestions would of course be based on statistical evidence such as what has never been borrowed by anybody mm -hmm. because that could perhaps also be interesting apart from just borrowing the most popular things. Are there any questions from the audience? Please. Is there any <laughs> public opinion uh, regarding this project of uh, way, putting waste underneath the local opinion of the public? Um, I think that before the film, there was very, very little knowledge about this facility. Uh, in particular, there were no knowledge about the time span and the implications of that time span. This only came with, with this film. And I know that the very first public screen of the film was in Finland at a festival and there was an audience member coming to me, a woman, and she said, I'm so ashamed of Finland because nobody told me about this. Uh, but Finland is a little bit peculiar in the way that it's a very, there's a strong belief in authority and that means that when something is decided in Finland, it's not really discussed. So it's a different culture of debate in Finland as, for example, in Denmark or, or even Sweden. Um, I don't know exactly what the situation is now with the, um, the Fukushima disaster, uh, but clearly uh, this has, I believe, also changed some things in, uh, in Finland. But the paradox remains that uh, even though you may think that these people ultimately don't know anything about what they're doing, still something needs to be done. And I'm not sh I can't actually myself figure out what to do besides then burying it. I, I can't really see that there are other possibilities, I'm afraid. Any other? 
uh, one of the main, what about uh, uh, other solutions in terms of, uh, uh, so to say, getting rid of the vast uh, by transporting, uh, transporting it uh, outside of, of, of uh, the earth? Some, somebody mentioned in the film that uh, there maybe could be uh, a rocket or something, you know, uh, a launch to, to the yes. towards the sun, but yes. uh, it is dangerous because uh, mm -hmm. there could be an accident. And yes. Stuff. So my, my question would be for you: uh, uh, What do you think? Is uh, is it uh, uh, there? Is there one percent or? or or less of possibility to find some other solution than trying to dig and digging deeper and deeper in, in, in the earth, uh, trying to get rid of not only of the, of the nuclear blast, but also of the problem, which is not only ecological, but also political. Yeah. So what do you think is this uh, uh, solution uh, what we saw in your film? Is it uh, in any way realistic, or it is uh, just you know to having a good uh, story uh, to be used in, in political terms? Because uh, people are probably aware that something must be wrong with you know that amount of, of nuclear uh, mass, uh, and uh, politicians are expected to find some solutions. Well, I really like the idea that any audience is just as wise as I am in these questions, so what do you think from what you've seen? These are the persons who are doing it. I can tell you that another solution, a real solution, uh, would be to drill holes that would be perhaps three or four kilometers deep, and then you would just let the waste go down there four or five kilometers. If you did that, you would, not, you, you would not be able to retrieve the waste. And the facility in Finland is built what they themselves call a back door. So they can take the waste back to the ground, to the surface. And then of course you can wonder why do you want to have that possibility if you're saying that you're building something that has to be foolproof and, and locked away for 100,000 years, is that because you're thinking that when the uranium mines are empty in Africa, for example, and you have the waste in your backyard, and there's still 97% of the energy left in the waste, that maybe one day you want to take it back to the surface? It's not required in the Finnish law to build that back door, but it is in the facility. There is no other questions, so thank you, Michael, for coming to Slovenia. I hope that this uh, first visit is not literally the first. Uh, I don't hope so either. Yeah, that you will come and present also some other projects we just mm -hmm. mentioned today. And thank you, the audience, and I suggest to prolong the discussion with a glass or more of wine. Yes, please, I'm, I'm available for yeah. questions, but have yeah. something to drink first. So <laughs> <when you're> <laughs>